Thanks, Mike. Um, you know, obviously the uh, preparation for us uh, this week uh, a little bit is uh, a little bit better. It was uh, obviously frenetic last week in terms of trying to get uh, you know organized defensively. Uh, feel a lot more comfortable in terms of uh, you know just organization uh, implementation where we're going defensively. Uh, there's a certainly a a carryover from last week to this week in terms of what we'll be doing defensively. So, um, you know, this will kind of be, you know, that one first week to second week. Uh, we hope to see a lot of improvement defensively. Um, like I said, there'll be a lot of carryover from what we did last week to this week. Uh, we'll add some things, obviously, that, that we feel that are appropriate to the game plan. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, more than anything else, we have a, you know, a group of guys that, you know, clearly uh, are excited about um, the prospects of, of where we can go. And, you know, we've got a challenging schedule in front of us. Uh, top ranked teams coming in over the next few weeks going on the road here against a, a very talented North Carolina State football team. So a lot to uh, a lot to play for, a lot in front of us, a lot of challenges, but more importantly, a group that, uh, you know, I feel uh, is, is really excited about uh, the direction that we're going, in particular on defense, and um, you know, we hope to build on that. Um, you know, there's going to be some ups and downs, and uh, there'll be some growing pains when you play, you know, 18 freshmen and redshirt freshmen. Uh, in particular, you play 11, you know, true freshmen. Um, there'll, there'll be some of that, but you know, I told our staff yesterday, and I'll probably be the last time that I refer to that. You know, going into, you know, now our sixth week. Um, you know, you're starting to get away from the freshman, you know, tag. You know, these guys have been around long enough now that they know what to do. Uh, they're just lacking some experience, but uh, they got to go out and play. And if we're playing them, we trust them, we believe in them. Uh, and, you know, they're our guys uh, for right now and, and moving forward into the future. So, um, you know, it's, there's good energy. Very good morale, and like I said, I think um, you know it was good from from our perspective as coaches that we also uh, were able to feed off of other things on the field. Defensive stops, you know, um, twenty percent efficiency for or twenty eighty percent efficiency on third down gave our offense a lot of momentum. Um, you know, other than the one, you know, obviously, uh, you know, punt return. Um, game-breaking plays on special teams. Uh, we were able to feed off of that. So, you know, the first time this year, uh, there was momentum that other units created for the offense, defense, and special teams. So, in, in some ways, it was like week one of what you want your football team to look like, and it's now something that, that they all see that we have to build off of. So, now we go on the road against a very talented football team. Um, you know, uh, the running back, Days, is a very, very good back. Quick feet, hits the holes, accelerates as a senior. Uh, guy that, that uh, week in and week out is getting 100 yards rushing. Uh, the receiver, Samuels, is a, he's physical, runs after the catch. Um, Finley is a very efficient quarterback, smart, uh, does a great job of taking care of the football. Uh, very good system of offense. They got good players. They got good coaches and good players, and they'll be playing at home. And it's it's a good football team. So it'll be a really good challenge for our football team. So with that, you guys got it. Take it away, Brian. Uh, is has there been any talk between the two schools about an alternative plan if Hurricane Matthew comes climbing up the coast on Saturday? Yeah, we've talked uh, at. Uh, at great length, um, commissioner uh, of the ACC has spoken with us about really everything's on the table right now. Um, we've kind of given them a window that we're available to play this game from 12 o'clock till noon on Sunday. Uh, we feel like anything after noon on Sunday starts to encroach upon our ability to prepare for Stanford. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of flexibility. Um, we feel like we've secured accommodations and flights and such to leave a big window of availability to play this game. 
What about moving it earlier? Is there any talk about Friday? There has not been any talk about moving it to Friday. Um, so at, as we stand right now, there will be another conference call, I think, at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Um, I'll probably have some more information, and if something becomes more definitive, we'll get it to you. But those discussions have already started to take place, and I think everything's on the table. One of the things that we hadn't talked about is moving the game up. In terms of your game planning, uh, alternate game plans in case there is a monsoon like Clemson last year? Like Clemson, throw it every down in the fourth quarter. Um, <laughs> just try not to turn it over and get too far behind in the game. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, for us, it's always, it's always about wind more so than it is about precip. And, and so the field conditions are, we've been told should be, unless it's unplayable, uh, we should be able to, to, to be fine relative to the field conditions. Um, but, you know, we, we are very good at moving the ball um, and throwing the football in most conditions, unless the wind becomes, you know, uh, at a point where the ball just can't be moved through the air. Then, then we get into, you know, formations that we already have in our system, and, and we'll em employ those. You've had, at, earlier in the year, you had Fertitta at your strong safety and Elliott at your free safety on the depth chart, on the printed depth chart. I'm not sure if that was reality. But this week there... I mean... Yeah, is, it looks like you want to go forward with Fertitta at free safety and Jalen at strong safety. If that's correct, what, what kind of led you to that conclusion with those two players? Well, you know, I think we, we look at, you know, for me, this has been an evaluation of our personnel and fitting the defense to our personnel and, and not being, um, again, this is, this, this is just putting my philosophy, defensive philosophy, over the past week into the defense. And I'm always and have always been about player, not play. And, and that is the same philosophy that, that we've, kind of put into our defense. It's really about the players, not the particular scheme. So we're really fitting the players to the scheme, not the scheme to the players. So you're seeing some people move around to fit to the way um, I want our defense to look. With, with Julian Love, when did you kind of start to gain trust in him and what has been able to increase that trust that he's become a big part of your defense now? Um, you know, I think for most young players, uh, it's, it's the, the learning process uh, and retention. So, you know, what they can learn and what they can retain. And, and I think early on, it was pretty clear that um, he, he was able to pick things up um, pretty easily and then, and then go back out and retain it later. Uh, and we knew his athletic ability um, was, you know, not going to be an issue for us. Um, and then I think when we were looking for somebody to uh, play the nickel position, you know, we, we had certainly Sean Crawford pegged at that position. And when we felt like we had to move him outside, we felt like Julian showed in camp his ability to pick things up. And that's when, you know, he got a lot more work in, at that position. Subsequently, um, and going kind of back to what we talked about with Fertitta, um, you know, I feel like that better, that, that position best fits Cole Luke now. Um, so, you know, Julian is, is able now to, to be a guy that can now go back out to corner and play a little bit more corner. And again, I think it has to do with knowledge and retention. I'm sure that there's a lot of things that you're trying to do incrementally with the defense. He couldn't do it all in one week. But in terms of pass rush, where do you feel like you are with that? Or how can you maybe improve that area? Well, there were a number of things that, um, you know, I think we're going to get a chance to work on and spend some individual time on that, that I, I think are, are going to give Keith uh, the opportunity to work on some specific things. Um, you know, the game, as we all know, is, um, you know, in particular this past weekend, um, 
you know, short drops and get the ball out of hand quickly and then scramble. And, and so, you know, even when we sack the quarterback, they give him a yard gain, you know. Poor Isaac Rochelle has been looking for a sack now for all year and then, you know, he gets a yard gain on what is a sack. So I, I want to be careful that, you know, we don't get too caught up in the fact that we're not getting sacks. I want quarterback hurries and I want pressures. And so that needs to be the focus. So the vocabulary to me in that defensive room is pressures um, and, and hurries. And, and if we can do that and, and play the kind of coverage uh, that I want, um, I'm going to be happy with the kind of pass rush that we get. Brian, you were asked last week about uh, Kaiser's carries. Um, so far through the season, he uh, is second the team in rushing uh, and in carries, uh, almost as many um, as combined as Williams and Folsom. Does that need to change? Uh, does that need to change? No, I don't think it needs to change. I don't think he carried the ball but twice in our four-minute drive. We call it a four-minute drive. Our four-minute offense when we had the ball for six minutes. Um, I don't know if he carried it, but he may have not carried it at all in that six-minute drive where we ate up most of the clock in the game. Um, so, um, no, he, I don't think that needs to change. He can still be part of our offense. Um, we monitor the carries carefully. I think a couple things have to change is that he can't expose himself to unnecessary hits. And we have to be very careful in terms of the run game that we put together um, that we're not putting him in a position where he has free hits. Um, I think that's the most important thing. And the run game, you, you've talked frequently over the years about wanting to have a balanced attack. Mm -hmm. I think this year it's one of the least balanced attacks you've had, at least production-wise. I think runs account for just barely a third of the uh, production. Why haven't you been able to run more effectively? Well, I, I don't know that we see it the same way. I, I think that... Um, you know, we throw it very, very well. And, and we've been given the opportunity. Um, we miss a couple open receivers. We throw for 550, 560. Um, I've always wanted to um, throw it equally as well as run it. And if you let us throw the football all over the field, we're going to throw it. And, and, and we won't run it as much. So are there things that we can get better at in the running game? Absolutely. Um, but we've been afforded the opportunity to throw the ball around the field. And um, teams have wanted to pressure our run game. And I think a lot of that, Tom, has been, look at all these young receivers they have, okay? Let's go challenge them. And teams have, and we've been able up to the challenge. Um, if they want to keep doing that, we have to keep proving that we can throw the football. And I think that you'll see that running game come back into more balance. The one area where it was pretty obvious where you didn't get the production you wanted was the four downs inside the 10. Yeah. Um, and you had a similar situation with uh, Nevada where I know the first play was a five-yard fumble. Yeah. So that's two cases where you'd think that Notre Dame would be able to line up and just drive all the middle. But in that, this past week, you kind of, I think you went to the outside every time. Yeah, we scored, um, you know, on a zone read in the opposite end zone, running the ball up inside, if you remember. Um, we chose in that situation based upon what we felt was the best opportunity was to get the ball outside. We felt like we should have scored if we just took the ball and ran outside, but we planted and tried to cut up, cut up inside. So as I said earlier, there are things that we think we can get better at. Uh, and one of them is, is trust what we're calling and take that ball and get it to the perimeter. Um, so, you know, again, we ran that play against Stanford last year and we walk into the end zone. So these are part of our offense. They weren't clearly as productive as we want them to be. It's what we do. We run inside. We run outside. Um, but I, I think that we're not getting away from what we do as our core. We just have to execute a little bit better. And last one for me, switching gears a little bit. What do you feel um, confident about or more confident about this week defensively than you did last week? You know, last week it was a little bit of turmoil. What do you what do you Pretty confident about going into this week. Guys are settled into, they they probably have a, 
probably a bigger trust factor and to know what to expect. Um, look, anytime there's a change um, of that magnitude during the season, everybody wants to, you know, say the right things, but still it's the proof. And I think in, by the time we got to halftime and the way they played, I think that there was that sense of this is going to work out pretty good. And so I think there's a um, bigger trust in understanding and knowing that, that we're going to be in pretty good shape defensively. Brian, up here. I think this sort of links together with Tom's questions. Even if your run game hasn't been as efficient as you want, your play action pass game has. Um, I guess, what do you think about your offense? Is it, is it Kaiser? Is it just the receivers? Is it the way people are playing you that has allowed you guys to be very effective there? Okay, uh, you know, we're averaging 500 yards a game and 40 points a game. I, I don't know how to answer the question other than um, it's a give and take, you know, for, for our offense based upon how teams are playing us. If, if, if I was to stand here in front of you at the start of the season and said, hey, we're going to go into the fifth game and we're averaging 40 points a game, I probably would take it uh, and, and 500 yards in offense. Um, we've got some young players. You know, the right side is still emerging. You know, Alex had a tough day. You know, he's a first-time starter there. Um, you know, we've got three new starters on the offensive line. We've got a bunch of young players on the perimeter. Uh, but they're coming together. And at 40 points a game and 500 yards, the numbers don't lie going into the sixth game. There's some, there's some really good production going there. And I'm not trying to turn the question around. There's some inconsistencies that are within our offense that are all about experience and staying with the system and, and working through them. Um, so when I go into that staff room, it's about drilling deep into specifics and fundamentals that is the core of getting some of the things corrected that I want to get corrected on offense, not big picture. I guess I, the, maybe a better way I said it is, is it just like 5% better here opposed to like a missing link somewhere? Yeah, no, I don't feel that. That's a better way for me to understand the question. We don't see a missing link. We, we, see, we see fundamentals not in play in certain instances. Um, uh, and, and, and some of it is guys wanting to do too much outside the realm of the offense. Um, and some of it is just the basic fundamentals um, that, are, that sometimes you don't get with experienced players. Last week you referenced, you know, you're not going to see a freshman go from zero snaps to 75 snaps. Okay, well, you got Troy, me there. Tro yeah. You got me I there. I mean, Troy, Troy Pride kind of came close. Uh, <laughs> so I was just curious, like, what did he show during the week that he could go from you know, maybe a fringe – demo guy to front line. He impressed me. I, I really was impressed with him. I wanted to play him. Um, and, and I thought we should have played him. And so I'm, I'm making those personnel decisions. Uh, we played him a little too much, uh, quite frankly. Um, we played Nico Fertitta a little too much. He had 90 snaps. He had more snaps than anybody because he had 18 snaps on special teams. So we got to do a little bit better job of balancing those things out from a defensive perspective. Uh, of course, we lost Devin early, and, and that kind of changed it up a little bit. But we should have used Avery a little bit more uh, in that situation to save all those snaps. But I was really impressed. His makeup speed is extraordinary. Um, he's smart, and he wants to play. And those guys are going to play for him. And, and so, his GPS numbers were good during the week. We got his volume up during the week. I thought he could sustain it. Uh, but the final say on, on this was that I wanted to play him. Had you watched a whole lot of him during September when he wasn't really a, a, a factor in the rotation? Is yeah. That, did he catch, you? I guess, your attention more as a scout team guy against your offense? Yeah. One-on-one. -on -one, we go one-on-one -on -one every day in scout team. And I was like, that guy's as good as the guys we go against week in and week out. Brian, I'm curious, what is it about Greg Hudson that he's kind of endeared himself in such a short period of time to these players to the point where he's singing the victory march, they're all almost in tears, have, happy for him, and they've only really known him for a couple of months? Well, I guess you'd have to know Greg. I mean, you know, he's uh, high energy. 
Um, really good with interpersonal communication skills. Um, gets to know all players, offense and defense, um, and, and just has just has that kind of you know role as well. I mean, his role right now is to be um, you know the catalyst for you know enthusiasm. He's jumping out of the cake at the birthday parties, right? He's the guy, and so he's in that role too. You know, we've we've kind of I want him to be that guy for us, and. So he's really embraced that, and he's doing a great job for us. I'm curious, sort of a big picture, personal career question. When, I mean, you came up, you were played linebacker, you came up as a coach on the defensive side of the ball. When in your career did you see the narrative, so to speak, of you being an offensive coach kind of take hold? Uh, uh, I, I felt after my second year as a head coach that the, the, the head coach should be responsible for the football. Um, the, game, the game, there was too many decisions that happened during the game. Um, that, that he needs to be responsible for it. And you become a bit detached sometimes, you know, when you're on defense. Timeouts, fourth down decisions, um, field position, you know, those kinds of decisions that happen during the game. It's, it's hard to do that if you're not responsible for football and, and more focused on the defense than the offense. Ryan Finley's completing over 70% of his passes. Yes. hasn't turned it over yet. What's made him so effective there? Good system of offense. I, I really like what they do. Um, he's smart. Uh, doesn't doesn't go outside of what his capabilities are as well. You know, he he knows what he can do and he does it well. He's a, he's a veteran player. Uh, doesn't try to do too much, but does enough to be effective, very effective in what they're asking him to do. He's just a, they're a good team. They got good players. I'm curious, is there anything Mike Sanford can lend toward scouting that offense, having spent a year with Eli Drinkwitz on Boise? Or? You know, I've had so many coaches that know other guys and they think they know, but it, 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 not really. I mean, everybody, I mean, you get enough film at this t part of the season that you see enough games. I mean, if it was an opener, it could be effective maybe, a little intel, but at this part of the season, you're, you're going off your film exchange. Grant here in the middle. Yes. Uh, I know you'll know you'll be able to answer this better on Thursday than today because you haven't been on practice field. But do you anticipate Bivin making his first career start, or or might you have McGovern back? I think we'll have McGovern back. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Um, you, you used a lot of three man rush, three man front, and really got some pretty good push at at, at times. Um, did you anticipate? that that would happen going into the game, and how does this um, align your thinking as you move forward with your front? I like three-man. I've always liked the, the, the balance of the three-man front. Um, it will be part of what we do. It won't be all of what we do. We'll, we'll mix it in. Um, you know, I think when you're talking about, in particular, um, the ability to really get some one-on-one -on -one matchups um, with those, those tackles uh, with, with hard inside shades, you know, we were able to push their offensive tackles back. That's not necessarily going to be the case each and every week, you know, but uh, having the ability to change up where they, those guys line up um, is, is going to be more effective for us. Uh, and I think more than anything else, uh, they were single blocking. Uh, because we're forcing their guards to go out and protect the edges. So I think a lot of one-on-one -on -one blocks uh, allowed some of that pressure to occur. Uh, and when you're in the three down, uh, because of that edge presence that, that is shown, those guards have to kick out, and it gets you a lot of one-on-one -on -one opportunities. With what NC State does with Samuels, they give them the ball in a million different ways. They do. Uh, Harmon and Lewis. Does their style of attack offensively force you to be more aggressive with your secondary than you were last week? Um, well, you know, I think you, you have to obviously account for number one. I mean, you know, he, he's not really a tight end. You know, he's – so we, we have to treat him differently. You know, we don't want him matched up uh, in, in what we would consider – you know, unfavorable matchup situations. So we, we first have to check personnel groupings. That's important to us. But in answering your question relative to the secondary, um, 
we, we have to be on body. They're, they're a spot passing team. They're really good at, at getting into opening spaces. They have really good concepts that stress your defense. You can't be a vanilla coverage team. You have to show them different looks or they'll just, they'll, they'll, he's patient enough. He throws it over 70% completion. They'll, they'll, they'll just wear you out. You can't get off the field. I think they're sixth in the country or seventh in third down efficiency. So, yeah, you just can't line up like ducks or, or you're going to be on the field all day. Last season when, when Equinemius St. Brown was healthy, you told us about how effective he was, great ball skills. We never really saw that, I think, in any of the open practices. We don't give you much access. I, no, I, I, and I, I don't know why. That. I, I don't know why. But I, I'd, let, <laughs> I'd open the gates every day. Birch again. Yeah, is, it's Birch. <laughs> My, my, my question is what you're seeing him do now. I mean, obviously, that's what you were seeing that we didn't have an opportunity to see last year. Yeah, I, I felt like, um, you know, that W receiver position um, is, is one with, in our formation makeup, um, you have to decide how you're going to play it. If you want to double it, uh, you're vulnerable to the run. You, know, you don't have an extra fit to the run. If you go single coverage, we're going to throw the ball to him. And... So we felt like that was going to be a big position for us. And, we, and I felt like, and I said this, I think, when we had our first press conference, the W receiver is going to be crucial to the effectiveness of our offense. And I spent a lot of time with him. Um, I knew what he was capable of doing. Um, we really had to, um, in some instances, um, force feed the ball to him in camp. And, and get him a lot of touches, get him a lot of action, and, and build his confidence that he was going to be a big part of what we did. He had early success, he maintained that, and I think we're starting to see that happen during the season. And as far as Greg Hudson jumping out of a cake, which is kind of a scary image, did you determine that <laughs> role? It would be a big cake, too, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, that was, I know what you're saying, of yeah. course, with that phrase, that was, I mean, he determined that. That was his personality. That's and you and you rolled with that. Uh, no, that's what I wanted from Greg. I got you. I hired him for certainly uh, an experienced defensive coordinator. Has coordinated defense. Understands uh, the role and what goes with that role. Um, but clearly, um, his personality type, what I was making a change for, was to bring in somebody that had that kind of personality. Uh, we were making a change. Uh, and so clearly I was looking at the type of person he was and the kind of energy that he brings um, as, a, as a change and a departure from where we were. And how did that relationship develop? I mean, did he... Did he approach you? How, how was the relationship developed? Well, he was here a lot in the spring. Um, uh, he was a frequent visitor to our practices. So I got to build a relationship with him uh, during spring. Um, and, and, and as it was apparent that, that he was not uh, interested in, in going back uh, in the fall and, and had an interest here, um, then that's when I hired him as an analyst. And so he, he was here um, quite a bit and was able to you know, see him and observe his work and, and felt like he brought the right approach to the defense. As, and and he, he was the perfect um, you know, uh, additional piece to the staff that was already in place. Did he hint at wanting to do that or did you approach him about it? No, he, he, didn't, he didn't bring up anything to me. I called him. at. 6.30 in the morning, told me to meet me in the office and gave him the news. Thank you. Kind of segueing off that, do you see yourself continuing right through this month and maybe even to November taking full charge of the defense overall? Or is that something that piecemeal you might hand over to Greg? I, I wouldn't characterize my, I'm in full charge of everything. I'm responsible for everything. But I have a great staff uh, on the defensive side of the ball that is, is, is charged with you know, the implementation, the organization. I'm there um, to, to make certain that um, the right pieces are, are put in, into the puzzle, if you will. And, and I'm overseeing the personnel. 
uh, the direction of the defense. But, uh, you know, to say I'm in charge is, you know, uh, there, there are many, many other coaches in that room that are taking a lead role. Well, I'm just saying more so in practices, you think you will be spending more of your time on that side of the field? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be there quite a bit. And, and I would think that that's going to be the case most of the year. Um, you know, there's just a lot of decisions that still need to be made. And, and um, quite frankly, I, I need to continue to, you know, just see the, over, the overall workings of the defense and the personalities and the players. Uh, we're playing a lot of players that I want to continue to evaluate. We've talked about Julian. We've talked about Troy Pride, but the guy who ended up with the most snaps by our count on defense was another freshman, Dante Vaughn. He had the and, most and uh, up for the corners, yes. Right. And the fact that he began showing it in previous weeks, the interception against Duke, what have you seen in him at 6'2", 6'3", he's got that range that you don't often see in a corner, but apparently also the hip flexibility. Yeah. What, what is it that has enabled him to become so effective so fast that you have such confidence for that many snaps? Uh, you know, obviously he's a unique player in that he has, you know, the size and the flexibility to play that position. Um, he's, he's not afraid. Um, he's not afraid to play. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, there were times that we were probably a little bit, you know, too far over the top in coverage in his instances. But he's going to be a really good tackler. Um, and he's, he's got really good ball skills. So for a guy that's long, fluid, athletic, he's not afraid. Um, and he's going to play the ball well in the air and tackle. All those things are really, really good traits to have as a six foot two corner. I mean, would you were you originally thinking that he might be more of a safety, that ball hawking safety on the back end there? Or? <sighs> Look, I wasn't involved in a lot of the conversations. I didn't recruit him to be a safety. I thought he could be a corner, and um, I'm glad we he's at corner, and he's not going to safety. He's not a safety. He's a corner. And uh, with a couple of other freshmen, with uh, Dalen Hayes and yep. Julian Aquara, yeah. what do you see with their futures as far as are, are they outside linebackers in the three four? Are they? Going they're going to be, be hybrid players. You know, they're guys that are going to eventually be big enough to do both. You know, they'll be, you know, they'll be that that speed end and and that rush player that be able to do both for us. Jameer, Jameer can play outside linebacker for us as well. He's skilled enough to play Sam. Um, and, and but those are gifted players. You see them run down kickoff team. I mean, they're down there. Um, pretty, pretty fun to watch those guys play. Is Dalen somebody you could see bulking up to the 270 range, or do you want to keep him kind of where he is at? Yeah. You know, he's he's a solid 245 right now, 246, and he didn't lift at all because of his shoulder. So, you know, he's going to be a 260-pound guy playing next year easily. So I could see him being in the 270 range. Okay. He's going to be a big hybrid. So with either Julian or Dalen, those are guys not you want to pigeonhole into, like, one area. You yeah, they don't the have to be. The rest of their careers. Nah, they don't have to be. They're, they're guys that are athletic enough to get in space. They can put their hand down and come off the edge. And, and they can, you know, they th really they can – they can take a tackle on and, and not get reached. So they've got, they've got some unique skills that we like and the ability to play both three down and four down. Thank you. Brian, down the middle here. You, you guys have had a lot of success recruiting the Carolina since you've been here. I was wondering if that's changed at all or, or your approach has changed at all with the ACC affiliation, getting a little more exposure in those states. No, I, I think we'll still be you know, along the coast. That, that's not a change at all uh, for us. Um, you know, obviously, we just talked about Julian, right? I mean, you know, Romeo and Julian, um, you know, both coming from Charlotte area. I think that's been a really good place for us, and I think we'll we'll continue to be. Um, so I, I don't see that changing any time. It's still um, a growing area, still an area that uh, we've had past success in, and uh, 
you know, South Carolina with, with uh, Troy Pride, obviously. So just this past year, we're playing two true freshmen on our defense that are from North Carolina and South Carolina. Hey, Brian. Oh. Yes. Um, I, you kind of touched on this a little bit with various freshmen, and you have obviously so many playing. But what, I don't know if there are specific moments you can share that really made you realize that these guys were actually ready to step on the field? Actually ready. Um, I'd like them to all be fourth year juniors, you know. Um, look, I, I think more than anything else, each one of them um, has different traits, but they all came here wanting to play. And I think that that, to me, more than anything else, is, is a matter of confidence and belief. They all believe they can play. They're all confident in their ability. So I, to me, that that's half the battle. And then it's getting them ready relative to the speed of the game, the techniques necessary, and and, and then you know, just understanding game plan from week to week. But they came here ready to play in their own mind. And I think that goes through our recruiting and, and understanding that when you come to Notre Dame, you, you, we don't have any red shirts, seniors. I mean, we got two of them, you know, Scott Daly and Mark Harrell. You know, we got two. We, we, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we played a team with uh, 15 red shirt seniors. And, Stanford's going to have 17 or 19. I mean, we just don't have many of them. So um, they got to be ready to play early. Would you like to be able to have more red shirts? Or I'd love to have 20 of them. It just doesn't happen here. It's just not the, these, these kids get their degrees early and, um, you know, they move on to, um, if they're not playing, they move on to another school or Wall Street or the NFL. And pardon me for not knowing this, but when was the last time you had this many freshmen playing? Um, was it, I don't know if it was last year, if it was a longer. I can't remember ever playing this many freshmen. Mm -hmm. Is it a record? So, yeah. If you need any questions answered. <laughs> Mr. Hansen is in the front seat. Coach up top. Oh, I'm sorry, Lincoln, were you done? Coach on top, yes. um, you talked about the D-line playing more three-man fronts. You also talked last week about the desire to get more players onto the field. Does, does more of a three-man look give you more versatility for where you can play guys, maybe not as much strong side, three technique type, type situations? Yes. Is that kind of factored into why you're making the change, or was it more of just you like that, that look better? Uh, well, I think there, there's more than just one answer to that. I think that it gets you more guys on the field because there's a, the ability to use more players uh, in, in the three down look that fit the three down. And um, it, it also, uh, from a structure standpoint, fits my eye. So it's twofold. It, it, it gets more guys on the field uh, that I want to see out there that can help us win. And it's a structure that I like in certain situations. So it's, it, it's both of those. Along the same lines, you seem to do more attacking with your front, even when you were just doing three-man pressures mm -hmm. and dropping eight, getting to the edge, guys kind of doing double moves. Was mm -hmm. that a Syracuse adjustment? Is that something you guys plan to do moving forward out of these looks? We'll be in much more movement up front. Yep. You talked after the Syracuse game about your defensive backs kind of changing their techniques, flipping their techniques. Kind of two questions about that. Number one is, is that also more of a, a – full-time change that you're going to see from those guys, first part, and then second part, what advantages does that give you, um, you know, kind of making some of those alterations, you know, schematically, what are you guys trying to get out of, out of those adjustments? Well, it's the way I want our defense to look based upon who the personnel is. We're playing a lot of young players. I don't want to put them in positions where um, I don't believe that, that they can have the most success. And I think it fits what, what I want to be able to do with the fronts. So the fronts have to match the coverages. So we're doing some different things up front with our fronts. So this is an extension of the, the coverages matching the fronts. So when, when you're changing some things up in the fronts, then, then there needs to be that, um, that natural connection to what you're doing in the back end. 
So that's why you're seeing some alterations in the back end of the defense. So those two things combined. Uh, and I want to get guys on the field that I think can, that, that can help us and compete. And I want to put them in what I believe their strengths are and their best, um, what, what they do best. And, and so that means maybe adding a coverage or deleting a coverage. So those three things um, are all why you're seeing some different things. And then every year you see a, a team who's struggling on one side of the ball and a coach will get before the media and say, oh, you know, we got to start playing more fire and passion and things like that. And very rarely does it actually change and change as quickly as it did for you guys on Saturday. What was it about your week of preparation, your players, whatever it may be, that allowed your team to really kind of turn that button up pretty quickly? Um, I, you know, I, I don't – look – all I can tell you is we, we coached our kids um, and we, we were honest with them. We put them in a position where I felt they could succeed and we let them play. And, um, you know, I effectively told them, you don't have anything to prove to me. Um, you know, just go play. You don't have to prove anything to anybody else. Just go play the game and, and enjoy it and play fast and here, just follow the instructions that we're trying to give you and, and go play. And I think that they, they went out there and they played. And, um, you know, we're far from perfect. There were a lot of things that we didn't do correctly, but we'll get cleaned up. But I think for the first time they just played, and, and that's what they got to keep doing. Brian, uh, I wanted to ask you about the, the change you made, like with Cole Luke going to the nickel. Uh, I'm wondering if some of the veteran players during that transition period, even though it was just a, a day or two, you say, Coach, I think I could help us better at nickel. I mean, did you get any input from some of the, the veterans? Well, I asked Cole, um, and Cole immediately said, Coach, I think I can help us at nickel. And I felt like he could. He's savvy, he's smart. Um, Man, he was in great position under – he forced two or three balls that you wouldn't normally see that were thrown poorly because of his underneath coverage. We hadn't had that in a while where he was just in really good position in some underneath coverage. Um, he got caught in a couple of um, bluffs, but he did some really good things for his first time there. And he's just a smart kid. You know, he's always had to be smart. You know, he's not a blazer. Um, and um, he brought a lot of um, experience and intellect. It was, it was uh, enjoyable for me to talk to him on the sideline and, and get really good feedback in terms of what was going on and be able to make the adjustments with him. So he was one of those guys that said, hey, I think I can help us here. During the course of the game, there was a lot of celebration going on the sideline. It was great to see the enthusiasm and, and that going on. But there's also a lot of it on the field that harkened back, I mean, some of the really good teams we've had here over the years. You see guys get up and they, they congratulate each other on the field. Uh, it looked like Daniel Cage was really engaged sometimes. It looked like some of the guys were like, yeah, you know, that's, and, and it's great to see uh, that evolution to, uh, you know, it's good that the coach wants to congratulate me too, but I got, you know, I got you and you got me. And it seemed like there was more of that going on. Well, we'll see how that goes. I mean, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it was good last week. We got another really good team we're playing this week. and. We just have to understand, you know, that it's hard to win. Um, just look at college football. It's, I mean, offenses are allowed to do a lot. It's cheating on offense right now. I mean, we're playing with a lot of young, inexperienced players, and, you know, we're averaging 40 points and 500 yards. I mean, it's crazy. Um, and it's hard. There are so many things that put you in conflict on defense. You know, as I've gotten to spend more time on defense, it's hard. And, and so you've got to have something else going for you. And that is you've got to have trust. You've got to have a belief. You've got to enjoy playing. Uh, you've got to, you got to have energy. And, and if you don't have those special ingredients playing on defense, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in big trouble. And if you, if you look around college football right now, there's some great programs giving up a lot of points. And there's some, you know, really good players on those defenses. So it's more than just scheme. Uh, it's more than just how many stars you got next to them. You've got to have other things going for you. And um, we're not going to lose that again. 
All right. We good? JJ? Good. JJ? You got one. Just so you know, uh, your practice access ends with this one question. So, no, I'm kidding. Go ahead. Do I, can I get two questions? <laughs> no. Might as well go for it now. <laughs> with the, the freshman defensive backs, I remember on signing day you mentioned that you, you know, you and Coach Light never thought four to five of the seven would play this year. When you mentioned, you know, players believing they come, you know, they can come in and play immediately, but does it help reinforce that when you as coaches are able to say on signing day, you guys are going to play, you know, that early to kind of reinforce it and then help them grow over, you know, or I guess come to campus a little bit more ready to play? Yeah, I, I think I probably would say more so that, that we're truly going to give you a chance to compete for playing time. And, and it, regardless of whether you're a freshman or a senior, um, we're going to play who we believe are the guys that are going to help us win. And so if you look across both sides of the ball, um, those guys are going to get a chance. If you're a senior, um, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're the starter. We're going to give you a chance to compete. And I think that's probably more important uh, than any, anything else when, when you come to Notre Dame. I guess, like, for a, you know, it seems like every recruit expects to play, you know, their first year when they sign. But to come in knowing that the coaching staff is saying it, that early, can that kind of change their mentality from from day one going forward? You know, I I can tell you that I clearly vet out with the recruit. You know, what is he thinking? You know, what's his thought process? Uh, because I don't want any misunderstandings. You know, when a young man comes here, hey, I thought I thought I was going to sit the first year or. You know, I, I, I was under the impression that I was this or that. So there's clear transparency in that because the last thing you want is somebody that comes here and, you know, I don't know, something was said in the process before I got into the closing of it and I wasn't aware of it. So there's pretty clear communication between me and the family and the prospect relative to that um, b before there's a final commitment. Great. Good. Thank you, everybody. All right. Only three hours. That was pretty good.